Hi, I'm Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. Headaches are an extremely common presenting complaint, so I've dedicated an entire video to them. In this video, we will discuss several types of headaches and how to differentiate between them. We can classify headaches as primary, such as migraine, cluster, or tension, or secondary which is due to a neoplasm, a metabolic cause, or inflammation. I first want to point out some red flags for headaches. If a patient presents with any of these red flag symptoms or signs, this may prompt urgent secondary care referral and assessment. Let's start by talking about tension headaches. Tension headaches are symmetrical headaches lasting between 30 minutes and 7 hours associated with stress. They come on gradually and classically feel like a band of pressure around the forehead. They can be associated with scalp, neck and shoulder tenderness. Tension headaches are managed with aspirin, paracetamol or NSAIDs like ibuprofen acutely. To prevent further episodes, explain precipitating factors and discuss lifestyle changes. Give the patient oral and printed advice about tension headaches. Encourage the patient to do activities to help relieve stress, such as yoga, massage, exercise or a cool flannel to the forehead. Acupuncture, up to 10 sessions over 5-8 to eight weeks, may be beneficial to some patients. If recurrent episodes, despite lifestyle management, then low-dose amitriptyline, that is between 10 to 75 mg once daily, can be given as prophylaxis. Migraines are unilateral, pulsating headaches associated with aura, nausea, vomiting, photophobia and phonophobia. Symptoms may affect daily life as they can be triggered or worsened by physical activity. Patients may report that going into a dark room or sleeping helps relieve the symptoms. Auras may precede the headache and last between 5 to 60 minutes. They are characterised by fully reversible visual symptoms, sensory symptoms or speech disturbance. Migraines can last between 4 to 72 hours. Risk factors for developing migraines include family history, a previous migraine, unavoidable exposure to triggers such as stress, menstruation, irregular or inadequate sleep, dehydration, exercise and weather changes. On examination, there will be no neurological signs. The first step of management is conservative. Advise the patient to create a headache diary, which can help identify triggers and avoid them. Adopt new, good sleep hygiene habits. Drink sufficiently and exercise. In an acute attack, a triptan can be given nasally or orally, as well as simple analgesia and antiemetics if necessary. Prophylaxis with either propranolol, topiramate or amitriptyline may be appropriate for recurrent migraines, that is, two or more attacks per month that are affecting the patient's quality of life. Propranolol is preferred instead of topiramate in women of reproductive age due to the risk of teratogenicity and reduced effectiveness of hormonal contraception. Propranolol should not be used if the patient has asthma, depression or peripheral vascular disease. 10 sessions of acupuncture over 5-8 to eight weeks can be prescribed as it has been shown to reduce the rate of recurrence of migraines in some patients who have received little benefit from pharmacological prophylaxis. Riboflavin may be effective as migraine prophylaxis in some patients but should be avoided if the patient is pregnant or planning a pregnancy. Avoid opiates as they can lead to medication overuse headaches. In temporal arteritis, which is also known as giant cell arteritis or GCA, patients present with a sudden onset of a unilateral localized headache with scalp tenderness over the temporal region. They may also complain of jaw claudication and visual symptoms like partial or total visual loss in one or both eyes. Patients with polymyalgia rheumatica, patients who are female and or over 55 years old, 
are at a higher risk of getting temporal arteritis. The investigation that will help diagnose temporal arteritis is a temporal artery biopsy. The biopsy will reveal skip lesions in temporal arteritis. It can also be useful to measure blood inflammatory markers like CRP and ESR if the diagnosis is in doubt as well. GCA is a medical emergency. If the patient presents with either jaw claudication, loss of vision, intermittent blurring or diplopia, immediately start treatment with prednisolone, 60 mg, plus aspirin, 75 mg. Urgently refer the patient for a same-day review by a rheumatologist. If there are any visual symptoms, then a same-day ophthalmology review is essential. If the diagnosis is likely to be temporal arteritis but there are no visual symptoms or jaw claudication present, then start the patient on 40 mg of prednisolone and 75 mg of aspirin and refer to rheumatology to be seen at least within three days. Once signs and symptoms resolve and inflammatory markers come down, you can start to reduce the dose of prednisolone to zero over about 12 to 18 months. The patient should be provided with a blue steroid card while on prednisolone. Consider gastro protection with a PPI and bone protection as well. Provide oral and written information on giant cell arteritis and signpost to local support groups like PMR GCA UK. A cluster headache refers to a severe pulsating unilateral periorbital pain associated with autonomic symptoms. For example, lacrimation, ipsilateral eyelid edema, ptosis, rhinorrhea, conjunctival injection and sweating. The pain tends to be short-lived and is relieved by physical activity. This is why patients during an episode appear restless and may be seen pacing during episodes. People who suffer with cluster headaches can go for long periods of time, that is more than a month, without having any cluster headaches and then suddenly have a cluster of episodes. This is referred to as episodic. People with chronic cluster headaches do not go a month without having an episode. An acute cluster headache can be treated with 100% high flow oxygen via a non rebreathe mask for at least 20 minutes. Subcutaneous or nasal triptans can also be given in acute attacks. For those presenting with a first bout of cluster headaches, it's necessary to refer to a specialist neurologist for diagnosis and initiation of prophylactic treatment, such as verapamil. As cluster headaches can be triggered by smoking and alcohol consumption, it's important to inform the patient of this and support them to stop smoking or reduce their alcohol intake if they require it. Cluster headaches are very severe and have led to their sufferers committing suicide in the past. Trigeminal neuralgia is characterized by a unilateral facial pain that's described as an electrical or shooting pain in the territory of the trigeminal nerve, usually around the cheek or jaw. The pain worsens on irritation of the trigeminal nerve, for example on closing the jaw, exposure to cold air or touch. The patient may also complain of autonomic symptoms. Attacks last from a few seconds to several minutes and there can be several attacks daily. The patient may go into remission for long periods of time before symptoms recur and pain-free periods tend to get shorter gradually. Trigeminal neuralgia is caused by compression of the trigeminal nerve, which can be due to intracranial mass, such as a tumour, MS, aneurysms, stroke, trauma, or it can be completely iatrogenic. To manage the patient with trigeminal neuralgia, it's first important to ask yourself what's causing the symptoms, if there are any red flag symptoms that make you worry about a space-occupying lesion of the brain, a stroke, head trauma or MS, then refer to secondary care. If there are no red flag symptoms, then trigeminal neuralgia is treated with carbamazepine. Once pain is in remission, the dosage should be gradually reduced as much as possible or even discontinue the drug until another attack occurs. Consider referring the person to a neurologist or specialist pain service if the pain is very severe or interfering with the patient's activities of daily living. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, also known as a thunderclap headache, is a very severe headache 
with a sudden onset associated with reduction in cognitive function, change in personality, reduced consciousness level, and meningism. There are two types of subarachnoid hemorrhage. The most common is traumatic, which is caused by head injury. The other is spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage, which occurs in the absence of trauma. Risk factors for developing a spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage include PKD, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and neurofibromatosis, as these conditions cause intracranial aneurysms, called berry aneurysms, to develop. To diagnose a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a CT head is done, which shows hyperdense areas indicative of an acute bleed. 12 hours after onset of symptoms, a lumbar puncture can be done to confirm subarachnoid hemorrhage if the CT was negative. A positive LP will have xanthochromia and a normal or raised opening pressure. Once subarachnoid hemorrhage has been diagnosed, you can consider carrying out a CT intracranial angiogram to visualize the source of the bleed, such as the aneurysm. Refer the patient to neurosurgeons immediately after confirmation of the diagnosis, as there is a high risk of rebleeding. Venous sinus thrombosis is less common than the other causes of headache, but they can cause cerebral infarction, therefore, they're not to be missed. Half of patients with venous sinus thrombosis will have sagittal sinus thrombosis. Risk factors for developing a venous sinus thrombosis include history of sinusitis, meningitis, facial skin infections, otitis media, a skull fracture, dehydration, pregnancy, thrombophilia, and use of the combined oral contraceptive pill. Patients will present with sudden onset of headache and signs of raised intracranial pressure, such as vomiting and nausea, seizures, and headache worse on waking, or with the Valsalva maneuver. They may present with a low GCS. On examination, you may see subtle neurological signs, including reduced eye abduction, that's a cranial nerve 6 palsy, reduced level of consciousness, and, on fundoscopy, papilledema. People with sagittal sinus thrombosis may present with hemiplegia. On examination of a patient with cavernous sinus thrombosis, you may also see signs of the underlying cause, for example sinusitis, pregnancy, or trauma. The gold standard test for diagnosing this is an MR venogram. As examination findings indicate raised intracranial pressure, it's also important to perform a head CT non-contrast or an MRI brain. Now, it's time to test your knowledge with some cases provided by my very brilliant friend, Matthew Tucker. See if you can guess the diagnosis for each of the following cases. Here's the first case. A 64-year-old man is brought to A&E after suffering a collapse. He describes an intense, sudden-onset headache. He cannot touch his chin to his chest due to the neck pain and stiffness. What's the most likely diagnosis? Yes, it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage due to the meningism and the way he described the headache. Intense and sudden onset like a thunderclap. Right, next case. A 52-year-old woman presents to the GP complaining of a number of painful episodes over the past few weeks. She describes an electric shock-like sensation on the right side of her jaw. It comes on suddenly and if she touches her face, it makes it worse. After a few minutes, the pain goes away. What's the most likely diagnosis? The answer is trigeminal neuralgia. The description of a unilateral electric shock-like sensation sort of gives it away, in addition to the fact it's triggered by touching the face. Case 3. A 42-year-old man attends a GP appointment complaining of a recent headache. He describes a three-day history of frontal and occipital pain, which he says feels like a pressure or tightness. It's somewhat relieved by ibuprofen. He's a new father and has no past medical history or drug history. What's the most likely diagnosis? Indeed, a tension headache. The clues in the stem are the pressure or tightness, which is like a tight elastic band around the head, and also the background of being a new father. 
This goes to show how important it is to ask about social factors when taking a history. One last case. A 23-year-old lady presents to the GP having had a headache the previous day. She recounts a severe 8 out of 10 throbbing pain worse on the right side of her head, shortly followed by a tingling sensation down her left arm. She explains that she had to dim the lights and rest for several hours before the sensation passed. She hasn't been particularly stressed recently, but she has had broken sleep on account of her neighbour's noisy puppy. She has experienced two similar episodes in the past but has not sought help previously. She has no past medical history and only takes the combined oral contraceptive pill. What's the most likely diagnosis? Yes, it's a migraine with aura. The fact that the pain is throbbing, unilateral and associated with photophobia and aura points towards the diagnosis of migraine. The aura is the tingling sensation described. An important point here is that this lady is on the COCP, which mustn't be taken by women with migraines with auras. This is because these ladies are at an increased risk of stroke. It will be essential to discuss alternative contraception, for example, the progesterone-only pill or implant. Right, we've made it to the end. Well done, and thanks for watching.